Welcome to the All For Your Life podcast, where you can write a new script for your life and become the hero of your story. I'm your host, David McRae. You are the author of your life. Let's get started. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello, Story Changers, and welcome back to another episode of the Isolation Inspiration Interview Series. Today's guest is Joy White Peacock. Joy empowers the people who empower other people as a stress and trauma expert, ex-corporate executive, and accidental shaman. Doctors have given up on Joy on five different occasions leading her to become certified in more than a dozen holistic healing modalities. After being hit by a drunk driver at 24, Joy learned how to reprogram her brain to bypass multiple injuries to access a different part of her brain. Instead of being a vegetable at 30, she was the first individual ever to receive an Information Technology Award for Industry Development. Joy is now best known for reprogramming the brain for optimal levels of productivity and joy, clearing stress in three minutes or less, and dissolving emotional trauma painlessly. In this interview, you will learn what dying five times, (laughs) yes, dying five times has taught Joy about life. We can swap our thoughts at any time, how to reduce stress, in three minutes or less, and that during coronavirus, you have to choose what opportunities you create for yourself. You're going to learn this and so much more in this interview with Joy White Peacock. All right. Well, I'll start with the first time I died. (laughs) The first time. (laughs) I've died six times in this life. Wow. (laughs) I know. I am living proof that you only get to die when it's your time. So for those of us worried about death, really seriously, I've been thrown back five times. And that's not including the times I've tried to kill myself. So, and each time I've been returned with different skills, uncommon perspectives and unusual abilities. So I get it, (laughs) it's not my time. But the very first time was a bit startling. Um, I was, well, it was all startling, but I was 15 years old and uh, I flew off a cliff on a motorbike wearing a full face helmet and a bikini. They never found the bikini top (laughs) and the full face was trad. I remember being loaded onto the gurney and rattling down to the operating room and saying, please don't tell my mother, <laughs> hoping I would some be a hell girl to get back to where I'd snuck out of to go for a ride on this bike before anyone noticed I was gone. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. And I remember the anesthesiologist counting me down and the next thing I remember, I'm, I'm in a corner, high up in the corner looking down uh, at the operating table and the anesthesiologist said we'd lost you and there was this big flurry and I, I, I felt this oh my god that's me and then I felt this overwhelming oh my god that's not me it's just my body ah. and this enormous feeling of freedom and I hope the whole light experience before it was fashionable <laughs> and it's true it's absolutely true and they'll tell you, oh, it's the chemicals and the this and the that, the body releases. I was dead for two and a half minutes on the operating table. And, uh, and I can tell you, as can anybody else who's seen that light, that it is pure, unconditional love. And I was not pleased at being stopped and sent back. Every fiber of me wanted to stay in that light. I end up back in the operating table and uh, back in the uh, ICU. Uh, 
and doctors telling me that uh, now I'm not going to be able to walk again and dancing was my life. I told the doctor I'd not only walk, I'd dance on his grave. And uh, that's actually how I became a silver medal ballroom and Latin dancer. <laughs> but that's oh. another story. Um, I was never afraid of death again. It took me seven years to literally get myself back up on my feet. It was challenging times for lots of reasons. Actually, I've just started recording these stories. So I, with everything that's going on and being in quarantine, I'm, I'm feeling really impelled. Upstairs management's been on at me for a while to record the stories. And I haven't, but now it feels like time. So I'm putting them up on experiencejoy.com. It feels good to tell them, so I'm grateful for the opportunity. I um, found that I was exceptionally good at making money and loved it very much. Um, I would put together wonderful programs, uh, like discount cards for executives, sell them nationwide, and, and, and just, well, I, was, I was having the best time as, a, as uh, creating my own businesses. And, um, and I married a, a bloke who just was fine with being a house husband. He was amazing. He looked after everything so that all I had to do was go out and make money and, and grow businesses. It was my life. And in New Zealand, I was a bit of a big fish in a small pond and that wasn't working anymore. So I convinced him to go to Australia. And uh, we landed in Sydney and I started building another empire. I was totally rocking it. All my goals were around, uh, how, you know, millionaire status and how many houses could I have and all of that. And uh, four months after we arrived, I was hit by a drunk driver. And I smashed up my leg so badly in the accident prior, seven years prior, that nobody noticed 13 displaced vertebrae in my spine. And these all came into play now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I couldn't, couldn't lift a glass. I lost 70% of the strength in the left side of my body. Couldn't raise my arms above my head. Couldn't wash my hair for like, seven years or so. Seven year cycles. Couldn't speak without stuttering. Couldn't stand or walk for more than a few minutes. But the biggest challenge that I had was any time I went into any kind of stress, the soft tissue would swell at the base of my neck. Blood would stop going to my brain and I would have about three minutes before I blacked out. Now, I never knew whether I would wake up from any of those blackouts. And I was blacking out multiple times a day at one point because it was a very stressful time. Yeah. So I became a world expert on clearing stress in three minutes or less. My tools work. I'm still alive. <laughs> But it took a minute to get there, you know. It took a minute to learn these skills. Dog just gave up on me again. They said I'd be uh, dead or brain dead by the time I was 30. Because every blackout was creating an oxidative stress wall in my brain from the oxygen deprivation. So after a while, I, I no longer had access to my frontal lobes, which means I couldn't think forward or remember back. So I became a master of living in the moment. <laughs> and it's absolutely true what they say. As long as you're focused in the moment, you can cope with anything, anything. <laughs> so I teach how to be in the moment now. And my life is good because even though I have an insane life, I have the cartoon version. So, I mean, the reason I bring so much hope and help to the world, David, it's got nothing to do with all the letters after my name and the bits of paper I've acquired. It's because people look at me and go, oh, okay, if she can do it, I've got a chance. Yeah. And they're right. <laughs> they're right. Hmm. I walked with death for about two years. As I saw 
one, two specialists a week. Nobody knew what to do with me. We got to be good mates, Death and I. He taught me how to live. The awareness of our mortality, there's nothing like it for appreciating life. He taught me about priorities <laughs> and the difference between urgent and important. The question I would ask myself is, how will this matter a year from now? Or will this matter when I'm dead? <laughs> and that pretty quickly sorted out what was important from what was merely urgent. I uh, went and saw, I, I remember the, the moment that I took my power back from the doctors who were just passing me around like a, you know, an interesting thing until the money ran out. <laughs> It was uh, this last doctor, he didn't tell me what he was going to do. He just hooked me up and gave me electric shock treatment. And that was the moment that I went, no more, no more. I'm not letting any one of these people touch me ever again. And uh, I saw a psychiatrist um, and that was actually really helpful because he said <laughs> that in order, <laughs> what I needed to do was take up basket weaving or some such so that I could continue to be a contributing member of society when I was a vegetable at 30. And I, I told him what I thought of him and his advice and his profession and his parentage and, just, and it was very cathartic for me. I've never been big on talk therapy anyway, like more about fixing than talking, you know, I just want to get it done. I didn't know how I was going to do this. But, okay, that's it, I'm out. And that's, tried to kill myself, that didn't work, obviously. God's going, ah, ah. <laughs> so well, what can I do then, you know? Because not a damn thing in this body Nothing, none of the, the, the thoughts or dreams or, or aspirations or, or like, they were gone. So I did the only thing I could think of doing. That was I killed the person that I was inside with all of those dreams and those hopes and those thoughts. And I, and I built up a new person, somebody who would be able to, operate in this body. It took a while. The first thing I, I did, we moved from Sydney and Elizabeth Bay with our fabulous apartment looking out over watching the Sydney Hobart Yacht races. Oh, we moved from there next to King's Cross to the outskirts of a little town on the New South Wales Victorian border called Ben Boca. And uh, there were maybe 300 people in that town. I never saw any of them. And that's where I rose from the ashes for the first, well, maybe second time. But first time, like total, that's it. One of the things I did, so well, you know, if I'm going to build a new me, it might as well be a good one. Like the best one I can create. So I wrote a list of all of the things that I didn't like about myself. Like, hmm, sometimes has difficulty telling the truth. I really didn't like that about myself. And so I then wrote the exact opposite. Always tells the truth. 
And I'd heard that 30 days will bring you a new habit. So, all right, so for the next 30 days, I rewired my brain into telling the truth, but every single time I told a lie, I would say, wait, cancel clear, I'm sorry, that's not true, let me say that again. <laughs> oh, that was so hard. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. I did that for all of them. And then I started looking around and going, hmm, you know, there's quite a few traits out there that I don't have that I'd like. And so I would look for the people that were, you know, doing what I wanted to do in the way I wanted to do it. And then I would model them. Preferably, I would go and find them, make myself indispensable to them, and then learn by osmosis because that's, that's the way I learn. Finally, got myself uh, to a point where I could uh, do with a bit of help, you know. So I said to upstairs management, All right, what now? And so we moved back to the Gold Coast on Queensland, just outside of Circus Paradise, which is what a lot of Kiwis do, to be honest. <laughs> and I started studying holistic medicine. I went to a lecture um, by this specialised kinesiologist, his name was Daniel, and he said, your body is the living expert on you. Nobody knows your body better than your body. You are the expert. And your body has the answer to every question that you could ask. Kinesiology gives you access uh, to those answers. And I went, hmm. Well, the doctors don't know what's wrong with me, but my body does. So I started studying specialised kinesiology. And then I learned how to reprogram the neurological pathways of my brain to bypass the injuries by thinking new thoughts. I never stopped studying after. I'm certified in more than a dozen different modalities, but I've studied way more than that. Because as I journeyed through all of these modalities, I uncovered these amazing tools and skills, like how to clear stress in minutes, how to dissolve emotional trauma painlessly, how to bend time, how to read faces, how to do stuff I would have given my eye teeth for as an executive, but they were all squirreled away in these esoteric places where nobody, unless they had enormous amounts of money and at least a decade, could ever possibly find. Well, I was in that position. So I took what I learned. I, um, uh, my grand passion became collecting tools that helped me live more joyfully and less stressfully in three minutes or less. And that's what I now travel the world teaching. Mm, cancel clear. That's not true. <laughs> I'm not Doing it still. <laughs> I am not walking. I, I am not traveling the world. I, I am, I, I, it's, it's, you know, I've been traveling this hemisphere since July of 2000. I'm tired. It's done. I'm, I, I'm settling now. Mm -mm. I am not a walkabout. I still teach these tools from the internet, wherever I am, anybody can access them. That's what's true. That's what's true. Giving thanks for my next perfect home, permanent home, or at least, you know, home. <laughs> anyway, I use my tools daily because <laughs> they work. They work. Actually, on my uh, website, Experience Joy, um, if you go over and, and, uh, and say, yes, I want to experience joy, I'll send you a 15 minute video that shows you how to relax instantly. Keep a clear head no matter what is going on and clear stress from your body. So use it. Oh, and before you go, before you start the video, um, measure your stress levels on a scale of one to a hundred. 
it's one of the very important things that I learned uh, when learning to, to understand my body and how to give it what it needed was to not say things like, you know, I feel bad. Okay, well, that's not helpful. How bad do you feel? What kind of bad, you know? And on a scale of one to 100. So on a scale of one to 100, how stressed are you? With 100 being <laughs> and zero being one. And really give yourself an idea and then go and do the video, uh, do the exercises with me. Look, I've got the, the most amazing empowerment tools on the planet, but they're no use to anybody unless you actually use them. So do the tools with me and measure your stress levels again at the end. And then let me know what they were. And then share them with your mates because everybody needs to know this. Everybody needs to know this. So should I stop talking for a while or should I continue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's pick apart a few things that you've, you've talked about already. I'm sure you've got lots more you can elaborate on. I guess that the first thing that's, that's really stood out to me, you've had these multiple death experiences, near death experiences or experiences of dying, but not dying. For the majority of the listeners who have not had such an experience, what do you think people take for granted most about life? Living. <laughs> um... I, I like that question, thank you. I wish the whole world could have a near-death experience and maybe coronavirus is helping us because people are suddenly looking at their mortality. I want to invite you to, actually, you know, it's a really good idea. I've got a, um, I, I do a, 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 a six-week course called Creating Your Ultimate Self and at the end I, I give people a near-death experience, put them in a coffin and they, all their friends and they do it, it's this whole thing. Um, so I want you to imagine, I, and I'm, I, I thought about that because when you mentioned it, I, I think I might put that up too, so that people can download, okay, death has come to visit you today. And, um, you know, things are a bit busy at the moment. There's a lot of, there are a lot of people going through. So here's the deal. If you fill out the following questionnaire, you may get an additional month on the planet. And the questionnaire is, so how did you spend the last month? You know, how, how are you treating the people around you? How are you treating yourself? What are you proudest of? And it basically has you look at your life. When I looked at my life, because like two years, man, I got to wake up and go, all right, well, what if I die today? What am I going to take to God as the sum total of everything I have done? Ah, look at all the money I made. And all the things I know. Suddenly, everything that I had considered so impressive just didn't look so trash hot when I took it to God as the sum total of everything I'd achieved on the planet. And so I looked to see, well, if I did die today, what would I be proud to take to God? And I came up with, I made each life that I touched more joyful. And that's what I founded my life on. So I would like to give you that. If you died today, and really, you might go out into the street to get a bottle of milk and be run over by a stampede in camel herd. You know, <laughs> you don't, it's not guarantees. You don't have, you know, people who are saying, oh, he was too young to die. No, he, you no, know, his contract was a bit shorter than you thought it might have been. And there are no guarantees. Live now. I still wake up in the morning and go, really, another day, all right, all right, let's get into it then and see how many lives I can touch. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question that's just popped up for me. Is your real name Joy or did you give yourself that name? No, darling. Yeah. I, um, every time I, I came back into the body, it, it was with a different consciousness. And that didn't, the old name didn't fit. <laughs> it was very strange, very strange. And it wasn't just the, like, the gifts and things. Um, it was odd things, like I used to be the world's best present buyer. I loved it. It was my superpower. I could, I could buy the best gifts. And uh, died, came back, couldn't buy a present to save myself, but all of a sudden I could decorate a room like you wouldn't even believe. You know, it's just like some trippy stuff. 
So the, the, I've changed my name every time I've died six times now. So joy is, um, joy is what I chose, although it was part of the, part of the, actually, you know what, all of the, all of the names have been linked right from the beginning. It's true. It's got an eyelash in my eyes. Um, so joy is the name that I chose to remind myself of what I embody. Because mm -hmm. I'm kind of reminding sometimes. <laughs> and when, uh, when someone says joy, I'll, oh, oh, that's right. Am I in alignment with myself? Or when people go, oh, yeah, you sure are. Doing good. <laughs> so, yeah, it's helpful. Joy yeah. is who I am and white peacock woman is what I am. Nice, yeah. I thought it was interesting when you were putting such emphasis on joy. Um, that's what made me wonder, was that a happy coincidence or was that, was that designed? Uh, going back to, to some of these experiences and in particular the aftermath of the two injuries when you were going through this process of rehabilitation in, in all senses of the word what kept you going during that time because that's a very difficult <laughs> experience and as you said you you struggled with it a lot what kept you going well <laughs> honestly um i clearly wasn't going to be allowed to die so i might as well get on with it the, the truth is you can only sit so long in a pity puddle before it gets smelly. And uh, i got a low tolerance for that. If I'm going to have to be here, I might as well make it good. That and I never knew what was around the corner. Like God was real sneaky about that. I'd have a tantrum, try to off myself, you know, let's fix this or take me, I'm not doing this. And there'd be, oh, here you go. <laughs> you can carry on for a little bit more. All right. So after, uh, basically my life has crafted me as a channel for divine will. I'm not qualified for anything else. You know, it, it, I have advantages that most people don't have when it comes to being a channel, which is... <laughs> No ability. Oh, cancel clear. That's not true. Uh, I, uh, I have increasing access to my frontal lobes um, and memories are coming back. Oh, God, which is trippy after 35 years. I had always thought that, uh, that God had kept them from me be, to be kind because it's been a very brutal life. Now I'm remembering <laughs> so many memories. Uh, but I, but again, like I, I'm, 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 I'm getting all of these traumatic memories and I have a course called reprogramming your brain. So your memories can't hurt you. So like I couldn't possibly be better qualified, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. I think I just volunteered for the cartoon version. You know how most people like, live you know get born and they live and they die and then they reincarnate mm, I, I didn't do that this time I, I feel like i just jumped life paths it's very strange it's never been boring though what kept me going upstairs management you talk about these um memories and also difficulty with future projections as well but at the same time you've shared with us your story today is this something that people have told you has happened <laughs> are some memories there but not others uh, just describe a little bit more about how how it works for you i've got oxidative stress walls in my forebrain so i I've, i'll be thinking along um and bam everything will be behind a wall but i've got the memories that i that i have been able to share so vividly are uh, accessed from uh, trauma <laughs> there's some things you don't forget and also um these are the stories that i i used to craft my life and and the stories that i share so um i have i have foundation memories i, I have about I don't know, three memories of my childhood, but now I've got lots more. Um, but there are, there are memories that's, that, that stand out that are, 
I'm just trying to see how many I've consciously blocked off and how many are behind the oxidative stress wall. And uh, how do I describe the wall? I know. Okay, so it's um, the oxidative stress walls in my brain were like um, I was typing away on my computer. I had a document that I had to get out by five o'clock. I was rocking the deadline, no problem. When to hit the print button, boom. Print button's behind the wall. And even though I've hit the print button a million times, it's no longer accessible to me. And all I can see is the wall and it looks like this. And everything goes quiet. And it's just, there's nothing but the wall. On my, in my bio, um, I have a video of what my frontal lobes look like. Uh, a, a rolling scan and they're filled with uh, intense orange little lines followed by big black uh, slashes gaps and this is my thoughts desperately oh <clears throat> and it made sense as i said why the doctors said i'd be dead or brain dead because it would have been just so easy to sit in front of that wall i guess it's not who i am so i learned to back away from the wall and find ways around it <laughs> and I did that by thinking new thoughts and what I eventually did was carve a new neurological pathway to operate from a different part of my brain so I can't think forward or remember back I learned how to think up and look down so perspective is my superpower and so instead of being brain dead at 30 I had co-created Australia's first end-user computing support organisation. I was advising state and federal government. I had, I was the first individual ever to be nominated for an ITT Excellence Award for Industry Development because I'd created an entirely new industry in the, in the support industry. That was easy for me to do because I gave all of the details to my, uh, my husband at that time, he, he was able to, I, I can see when I, when I look at a person or a problem or an, or an issue, I don't, I don't see this, I see this. I see what the problem is, I see what the solutions are, I see how it's affected in multiple realms and dimensions um, and how to put it all together. It comes to me as a whole cloth, there it is. And I just gave that cloth to my husband and we created GUI Care and Solutions and Software Sanctuary. And, and a furore in the computer industry. <laughs> so, yeah. You've talked about this process of, of changing these, these pathways and these lists that you wrote, who I want to be, who I am now. Uh, and the one that we focused on particularly is, is truth, that I always tell the truth. What's the most difficult truth you found yourself telling? No, it wasn't really so much like that. It was like, oh, that wasn't true. You need to say what's true, you know? Like, um, I don't know, just everything. I, I made myself say, every, every time I wanted to tell a lie, I made myself tell the truth. Yeah. No, I really feel shitty today, actually. <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm working on creating. No, it's just whatever, whatever it was. So it wasn't a, well, it's the hardest truth thing. It was more of a... I'm just, nothing false is going to come out of this mouth. So mm -hmm. it's like that. I'll rephrase that question. Was there an area of your life where you feel you were consistently lying to yourself? No. It was just like an aspect of me that I didn't like. You know, it was just, I need to, I need to clean up my act. If I'm going to live in this body, I want just the, I, 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 because I'm an extremist, I just stripped everything away and started from the ground up and I wanted a clean foundation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were, there were lots of other things like 
investigated, there was laziness, and I'm still working on that one. <laughs> it's 30 years, more than 30 days. It's a, an ongoing thing. <laughs> Let's look at this, this process a little bit more then. The way that you described it was very wiping the slate clean and, and really starts again. In fact, the analogy that you used was the, was the phoenix from the ashes. It was almost like a complete reboot, again, using our, our IT metaphors. I feel there'll be some people who are listening to this who feel they kind of want to do the same thing themselves and say, man, like this person I've been, been in my life or try to be in my life, it's just not right. It's not working. How can I just wipe the slate clean and start again? How can I just turn over a new page and start with a blank sheet? Can you talk a little bit more about the process and maybe how other people can do something similar for themselves? Yes, yes, I would love to. Uh, because it is the time for this, this incubation period that we're in right now. now I, I, it's, I, I don't think of it as quarantine, I think of it as incubation. What am I, what, um, okay, so the first thing that, that takes all of the pressure off is evolving to the next grandest version of yourself. I am always perfect in my imperfections. And every time I evolve, I, 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 I will look at, at my behavior. Oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh my God. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm evolving. And now here is the way you want the fast track to enlightenment? The fast track to being able to create that, that, that person? It's shorten the periods of forgetfulness. You know you've fallen into forgetfulness when you start self-flagellating, which is really just nothing but a wank. It does, does nothing but keep you stuck. I'm sorry, am I not allowed to say that? No, no, it's not, not a children's show. <laughs> Just never heard an expression like that before. <laughs> so, that has never been my strong point, darling. You just have to love me anyway. Um, yeah, so when you find yourself going, oh man, look, I'm back in this pattern again. Ah, you can either self-flagellate. Or you can use that as a trigger to go, oh, oh, I forgot for a minute, so that I could have the fun of remembering. And bring yourself back in. That's how you shorten the periods of forgetfulness. When you find that you've uh, looped into a, an old pattern that you don't like and you're making different choices, use that to go, oh, that's how you do it. Sounds similar to the process of meditation where meditation is is not about not thinking it's about recognizing when your mind drifts away on a thought and then the act of meditation is the coming back to it and that's actually the training aspect of it it sounds very similar to that yeah i've got a trick for that too if you want yeah go i'm not shortcut shaman mostly because i've been into every kind of trouble that you can possibly imagine and i know all the shortcuts out <laughs> so uh so it's time to bring out the scissors and cut my own hair. Okay, so the first thing I do um, if I'm going into an important meditation is uh, I invite all of my thoughts to go sit over here in this box and I will attend to you all on the other side. So don't be worried about that. I'll come back to you or not. And so every time a thought comes in, I find it very much more efficient to just say, oh, no, go sit in the box. And because I've already told the aspects of me that want to come in and go, yes, but what about this? We should be doing this. <laughs> That's just informing them. It's okay. What I am doing now will help all of those thoughts. So it's safe for these thoughts to go sit in the box. And I'll talk to you all later. And that's one of the ways that you quieten the voices in your head. Mm -hmm. I'm in the US and they've got a big thing against the ego and they, they is that, do you have that in the UK as well? Mm. It's weird because I'd say culturally, cult, cult, culturally, um, the ego, the traditional sort of conception of it is, is probably encouraged, 
but then everyone will tell you because culture encourages the ego uh, if you really want to sort of find calm and peace then you have to remove the ego so i think there is, i think there maybe is this obsession with removing the ego but only because culturally it seems to be encouraged if that makes any sense now i don't think it makes any sense at all darling to remove the ego the ego is how we express ourselves in the world your ego is only a problem when you forget to put it aside when you've got other stuff to do you know i mean it's, i think it's a really valuable and important part of us that it, it needs to be integrated not ousted if you try and oust your ego, it's just going to yell and scream and rail to get back in because that's how you express yourself. That's literally the definition of it. I can't remember right now, but it's like it's, it's who you are in the world. It's your personality. So people are always saying, oh, how do you do the work you do? And, you, and your ego doesn't get in the way. It's because I'm, when I'm working, I'm a, a hollow bone. I'm a flute the master plays. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a timeshare unit. I, I I've been travelling for so long, just going wherever God sends me and working with whoever's placed in front of me. Well, I know what I'm doing under this full moon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, does that answer? Well, I've forgotten the question now. Uh, I think I have as well, actually. Um, we're talking about meditation, thoughts. Mm. Oh, creating the next grandest version of yourself. Yes, that was it, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for those people, oh, look at my memory, look at my memory. Very good brain, wonderful brain. What I'm doing now is one of the most important things I learned. When I catch myself doing something right, I activate all my endorphins and, uh, and pat myself on the back and on the head and praise whatever aspect of me is, yes, good brain, good brain. And this is how I am growing so fast. When you catch yourself doing something that is in alignment with the next grandest version of yourself, give yourself a pat on the back. Yes, that's how we do it. Bring all of the aspects of you into supporting that. And it's really not difficult at all to, to evolve into the next aspect of you. The, the way you start is you write down who that is. You know, who, who would you be if, if you were the next grandest aspect of self? Who would you be? Now here, only allow those thoughts that portray you as the divine being you really are. Write down the aspect of you that you will be proud to take to God. And not type. No, 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 no. Because when you type, you're activating a couple of hundred neurons. When you write, when you let this run out of your head and down your arm and on black and white on the paper, preferably in a special book, a book you'll be proud to write in, a book that you will have as your own personal grimoire, your own personal book of magic of, of who you are creating. And you align your thoughts with the thoughts that that next grandest self would have. You think what they would think. You align your words, which are the manifestations of your thoughts. Your thoughts create, your words make manifest. Your actions, the, the, every action has its ancestry and a thought. You can't do anything without having thought about it. You align your words and your thoughts and your actions with who it is you want to become, and you will become that person. That's the fast way that I found. And if you need help with that, I'm amazing at it. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice. And uh, what I do is I clear the, um, the limiting beliefs and the sabotaging beliefs and the negative patterns and the programs because I'm able to see them. I actually guarantee immediate positive results with my work or I refuse payment. So that's experiencejoy.com. Have a look at the private sessions page and the video testimonials. And if you need big help because you've got big work to do or big things that are, oh, I couldn't possibly use things going on, then uh, I can help you. Yeah. Shall we talk about that a little bit more, the, uh, the current stresses and strains that we, we find ourselves in, this, uh, this coronavirus period that we find ourselves in. Uh, how has coronavirus been affecting you, Joy? What's been going on? 
Well, for, you know, for me, I've learned that there's always going to be a challenge, darling. There always is. And so it doesn't matter what it is. What matters is how I decide to feel about it. I have trained myself to, uh, and this is what I'm best known for, um, I've actually reprogrammed my, my brain to eliminate all of the bugs and the virus programs that it was installed with throughout society as I grew up. And uh, I have it as a baseline for joy. So it doesn't matter whether it's the coronavirus or the stampeding camel herd or you know, having all my stuff ripped off or another health crisis, doesn't matter. What matters, I can't control that. But what I can do is choose how I'm gonna feel. And it's this choice that matters because it's this choice that matters what happens next. So I have chosen, I'm, it's, it's, is it difficult for me to be in quarantine? But yes, and so I am not in quarantine, I am in incubation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, am I, you know, having challenges because I'm not able to, to hug people and do events and, and, and yeah. So uh, what can I do instead? What do I want to come out of the end of this incubation having birthed? Mm -hmm. And I, as with everything, I leave all of the details to upstairs management because I don't know. And to give you an idea of how that works, just before, um, just before the quarantine, I had landed in a place where it was absolutely toxic. And when I heard a, a quarantine was on its way, I went, oh, hell no, I am, I, I'm not, no, I'm not spending time here. And I said to upstairs management, I want out and I want out now. And I uh, packed up my room and my stuff and my maid had said, come stay on the boat. And nothing else had turned up. Because have you noticed how, even though you never know how, somehow what you need is provided. And never in the way you think it will be because yeah. you know how to glasses. And never a moment too soon so that you know it's them and not you. Yeah. And never too late because that's them, not you. So I'm taking my, uh, I've, I've already taken a, a suitcase to the boat. And I, and as I, as I left the boat, I went, no, this is unacceptable. I need to be on dry land. Oh, it's a beautiful big boat, but I don't want to be on the water for the next month or however long. I, 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 I need a big bath. Um, I, I need a patio. I can be naked outside on without freaking anybody out. I need my, well, you know, I need what I need. And uh, as my mate was taking out the last box, uh, or the, the next box to the boat, I log on to Facebook and there's Julia Grace and uh, her place is actually where upstairs management has put me between gigs in, uh, in LA. And it's the most perfect place. It's got this queen size boobs and knees bar. You know what I'm talking about, ladies. <laughs> and I have no idea, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the most important thing at a bar, the cleaning bar, is where you can get both your boobs and your knees under the water. Right, okay. <laughs> bath is, is the ultimate in, in, in joy. Oh, I love it. Um, and gorgeous private patio, beautiful banana trees, lovely, nobody, you know, no neighbours, no, gorgeous neighbours over there. Just, it's everything I needed. And, uh, oh, look, she's just, uh, imagine this. Like, she was in Hawaii in a, in a silent retreat for seven days. She came out and the world had changed. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was one of the first people, oh, imagine that, to, that she saw, aha, what's, you can't come home. <laughs> We're now in quarantine. Let me move into your house. So uh, now I'm renting this place. Um, and it's, it, you know, so Gustavo, instead of taking the box to the boat, took it to Julia Grace's place. So, and that was the day before the quarantine, or actually that was the day of the quarantine at midnight. That's it, it's the stay at home. <laughs> yeah, perfect place. So I've learned that this is how it always goes. You know, I've learned that this is how it goes. I've learned like you, that I'm the incarnate member of this team, the one in the body, you know, but not the only member. In fact, if you just take a moment to take a breath and think about how often has it happened in your life 
that the exact perfect circumstance, person, thing, whatever has been, here you go, here you go. Probably not a coincidence, is it? And it's no longer manners to go, oh, that was good luck. And it's time to give credit where credit is due. And just take a moment, take a breath and extend your awareness to who it is that stands there. You might, if you're clairvoyant, see an image or a light or a color, if you're clairsentient, you might feel that hand on your shoulder. If you're claircognizant, clear knowing that uh, you, you might have a deep knowing of, yeah, yeah, she's weird, but she's right. Yeah, I definitely reckon I've got a guardian angel. And if you're clairaudient, clear hearing, when you ask, oh, thanks for saving me on all those occasions. By the way, what's your name? And then listen for the answer, releasing the need to control how the answer comes. And it's the first thought, not the yeah, but thought that comes and going, yeah, but I don't know about that. Yeah, but I think it's better. Yeah, but no, don't do that. So the invitation with this is just to become more aware of who walks with you because darling, when you are, You'll never be afraid again. Do you have any insights or thoughts on how people can get through this situation and overcome it and get to the other side? Absolutely. Get to know who walks with you. Get to know your team. Get to know your angels. Yes, that's it. Without, without knowing, this is the most important part of my job is giving people an unassailable connection to their team to source, to their own source, because otherwise, well, well, what, what, do, what do you do? It's, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I, my job is to stand a moment listening for instructions, and they come on a moment-to-moment -moment basis so that they can be free from the pollution of the energy of the planet. When you become, well, I wasn't kidding, when you become aware of who walks with you and learn to delegate, learn what your job is as the incarnate member of the team is to do the things in the body. You know, to, 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 to type that thing or make that call or, or submit an invoice to upstairs management and release the need to control how what you've asked for appears. Because how is not your business. How is your team's business? You cannot do their job. Stop trying. They cannot do your job. They're not in a body. When you get yourself set as to whose job is whose, you know, life becomes a lot easier. Again, I'm talking from, you know, it's the, I have the frontal lobes of an autistic child. Oh, cancel clear. That's not true. Up until quite recently, my frontal lobes outpicture themselves on, on the, the movie as, as, an, as an autistic child. Now I'd love to get them re-scanned because I've done so much work. But, uh, so I now have more choice as to, you know, creating my own life. Before I didn't, before I was just a vessel, which is good, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, I love my job, it's great being a vessel, but, and, no, it's something for me as well. What opportunities do you see in this current situation, Joy? Whatever opportunities you decide to make. You know, it all put, look, we don't have control, clearly, about what's going on outside of ourselves. We get to control what opportunities we want to make for ourselves. What, do, what is the next grandest version of yourself? What do they want? Ask them. Just take a moment right now, tune in to that, okay, so if I was this next grandest version of me, what would they want? What would they tell me right now? Listen. more that you do this, the better you become. And yes, sometimes beliefs and thoughts will come up, oh, we can't do that, no, that's all rubbish, and all of these old sabotaging programs. You get to choose about which thought, oh, okay, all right, here we go. What do you get, oh, what color is a lemon? Yellow. What color is an orange? <laughs> orange. Yes, yes. My darling, you've just done the most powerful thing that it's possible to do. You have taken a thought, you've placed it in your mind, and you've exchanged it for another one. Now I'm going to tell you a wonderful secret. Are you ready? Yeah. 
this works for more than just fruit. You get to choose your thoughts. And in fact, you must, if you want to have a life that you desire rather than one you fear. Choose the thoughts your ultimate self would have or your next grandest version of yourself would have. Choose thoughts that are based in love. And no matter what it is, it really is. I've spent a lot of this discussion asking the questions, Joy. And I'd like to offer the final question of today's discussion to you. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask the audience right now, what would that question be? What do you want to take to God as the total of your life? How do you want to be remembered? What do your heart long for? What are your highest thoughts? If like me, you want to create yourself anew into the next grandest version of you, how do they think? What do they say? What do they do? How do they live? I want you to be asking yourself that question because then you can start living the answer to whatever degree is possible from where you are right now. And this is why evolving into the next grandest version continually is way, way easier and less pressure than evolving to your ultimate self. Do what you can with where you are from what you've got right now. And more as you follow those thoughts, as you are on that path, you see things that were not available to you before because you were facing a different direction on a different road. And release the need to control the miracles and how they appear. The thought that I keep whenever something happens that I don't think I can survive <laughs> and I can't find a joyful thought about it. I go to my old favorite, which has got me out of more trouble than you can poke a stick at. This is a miracle. I don't understand yet. So grateful that you had me on your show, David. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Joy, thank you for, for joining me today. I've, I've really uh, resonated with your, I guess, I guess bluntness, and, and blunt is often used as a sort of a negative term or, or a negative trait, but I suppose I mean that in terms of uh, frankness is maybe a, a better word where you've, you feel you've got this very frank relationship with life and death, and you bring this frankness into everything that you are and, and everything that you do. And um, that's really sort of shone out to me today and I'd like to take the time to acknowledge that. Thank you. Yeah, subtlety is not my strong point. <laughs> my clients call me the wishmaster, but my students call me the ass kicker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for joining me today, Joy. To continue to help you through this isolation period, I've decided to open up my Author Your Life Academy for free for the next three months. Author Your Life is my online educational community where you can access training sessions, workshops, and question and answers, and connect with other people around the world who are going through this situation and trying to make the best of things. The Academy normally costs $27 a month to subscribe, but for the next three months, I'm going to open that up for free. Essentially, you're getting a free month free trial of the platform. To access the Author Your Life Academy, go to authoryourlife.org forward slash academy and when prompted, enter the code CORONA in block capitals. Yes, what else would the code be? CORONA in block capitals and that will take your $27 subscription down to zero for the next three months. The Academy is where I'm going to be focusing a lot of my content during this difficult time. It's where I'm trying to bring people together to help and support each other 
as we go through this period of isolation, of fear, of uncertainty, I hope the Academy is something that will be able to help you too during this situation. So if you want to come in and join us, as I said, go to authorlife.org forward slash academy and when you sign up, enter the code CORONA and that will give you three months for free. It's my gift to you to try and help and support during this time as best I can. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it hugely if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the podcast. With your review, please be as honest and detailed as you can be. Because with honest and detailed feedback, that helps me to adapt and grow this podcast to most serve you, the listener. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then make sure you subscribe to the podcast. That way you aren't going to miss any of the future episodes that we've got lined up for you. Until next time, remember that you are the author of your life. You hold the pen and you can write whatever script you want for yourself. So go out today and write yourself a beautiful story.